Yadkin River is the lifeblood of the Piedmont. From its source in the folds of the Blue Ridge Mountains to the end of its journey, 430 miles southeast in the Atlantic Ocean, the Yadkin sustains our very existence. We depend on the Yadkin River and its tributaries for drinking water, for electricity, for water to grow our food, for recreation, for construction material, for industry, and for food processing. Our ability to do all these things is directly affected by the water quality in the Yadkin River. Unfortunately, poor water quality, water that is filled with pollutants and soil from erosion, makes it difficult to use the water in the river for the things we need. This is not just a problem with the Yadkin. The same problems can be found to one extent or another in every river basin in North Carolina, and the United States for that matter. What's this got to do with you? Everything. I'm Dick Everhart, District Conservationist in Surrey County. Over the next half hour, I'm going to show you why the Yadkin River is suffering and how each and every one of us can do our part to improve water quality in this wonderful river on which our lives and our livelihoods depend. The Yadkin PD River Basin is the second largest in North Carolina. From its northern limit at the border with Southwest Virginia, the basin runs south along the Yadkin River to Montgomery County. There, the Yadkin becomes the PD River and continues south into South Carolina. In all, the basin covers 7,213 square miles, making it almost the same size as the state of New Jersey. Within the basin, there are 5,991 miles of rivers, creeks, streams, and other tributaries. Placed end to end, these waterways would stretch from Raleigh to Los Angeles and back again, with enough left over to reach Boulder, Colorado. The basin includes 83 cities and towns and covers all or part of 24 counties. All told, 1.6 million North Carolinians live in the Yadkin PD Basin. Many of these 1.6 million are served by the 75 water systems that draw water from the Yadkin River. Together, they pull 165 million gallons a day from the river. Many basin residents also work at the thousands of businesses and industries and other employers that depend on water from the river. So, just what is this water like? We're here today at Bolton Elementary School in Forsyth County, and with the help of Mrs. Howell's third grade science class, we're gonna make some Yadkin River water. Let's get started. Do y'all know what this is? No, dirt. What is it? Dirt. No, it's not dirt, this is fertilizer. It looks like rocks, but it's fertilizer. It's what you put on your lawns and we put in our crop fields. And there are a lot of chemicals that end up in the river and our streams. Fertilizer is one of those chemicals. So we're gonna add a little bit of that to the water. How about this right here? Does anybody know what that is? What do you think? Dirty water. Dirty water. It looks like dirty water, but it's motor oil. It comes out of a car. And it represents the petroleum products that end up in our river. They wash off our roads and driveways, and if you're not careful when you change the oil in your car, some of this can end up in the river water too. So I'm going to add just a little bit of that. Now, I'm sure you all are going to know what this is. It looks like dirt, doesn't it? It's fertilizer for your garden. It looks like fertilizer for the garden, but you know what it is? It's animal waste. It comes from cows and pigs and horses and even cats and dogs. And I'm not going to put that much in, but some of that ends up in our rivers and streams too, so we're going to add a little bit of that. So. Now, how about this right here? You, that's dirt. That's right. You've answered that several times. And it's really soil. And soil is useful when it's on our yards or when it's in the fields growing crops that we eat and that the animals eat. Yeah, but guess what? Flowers. A whole lot of this soil ends up in our rivers. A lot of soil ends up in the rivers. And there it's not a good thing. So we're going to go ahead and add a pretty good scoop of that. And finally, just for good measure, 
You know what this is? Mud. Right, it looks like mud, it's red clay, and there's a lot of red clay here too in North Carolina, and a lot of that ends up in our river. So we're gonna add a little bit of that just for good measure, okay? Now I'm gonna stir this up real good, and this is what ends up in our rivers, and if we're not careful, too much of it ends up in the river, and that's not a good thing. And what I want to know now is, this is our river water. Who wants to come up and take a big drink? <laughs> Where does all this come from? It comes from us, from gas stations and junkyards, from golf courses, parks and front yards, from livestock, from junk thrown in the river, from farms and forested lands, and from eroding stream banks. And all of it causes problems. One of the bigger problems is excess nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus in the river. A major source is the overfertilization of our fields, our parks, and our lawns. The excess fertilizer runs into our waterways and ends up in the Yadkin, where it feeds algae and other plants in the river, causing them to grow out of control. Algae blooms are a clear way to see how poor water quality affects the river. The impacts of other pollutants is less obvious. Petroleum products and other toxic substances may not readily show themselves, but they harm less tolerant species of aquatic life that other species may depend on. And the fecal coliform bacteria that come from livestock and improperly treated wastewater may not in itself be harmful to humans, but its presence can indicate the presence of other waterborne pathogens that can cause typhoid fever, dysentery, and cholera. But when we talk about the economic impact of water quality, the big culprit comes down to just one word. The big culprit is sediment. The big culprit is sediment. 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 Sediment is soil that's dissolved in water. Now a little bit of sediment is natural in any river, but when a river carries a lot of sediment, like the Yadkin does, then it becomes a problem. All the gentlemen you saw a moment ago run water treatment plants that draw water from the Yadkin River. In this, the upper reaches of the Yadkin River, uh, in which Davie County is a part of, by far the worst problem in water treatment is sedimentation, suspended solids. Uh, the more sediments you have in the water, the higher the turbidity, the higher the turbidity, the higher the cost of water treatment. Uh, it costs more in uh, plant operation time, it costs more in chemicals, uh, it costs more in maintenance. When the river gets above a 40 or 50 turbidity for this plant, uh, we have to run longer to produce the same amount of water, uh, which drives our cost up even further from a labor standpoint. So sediment is tied to every aspect of water treatment. Uh, but it does drive the cost of water rates. The more suspended solids, the higher the water rates. And that's why over the course of years, water rates continually continue to escalate. If you get your water from a utility in the basin, your water bill reflects the cost of removing sediment from the water. But this is just the beginning. The cost of removing sediment from the water is passed on to consumers of every product that require a lot of water to manufacture. Products like Lee Jeans, which produces over 21 million pairs of jeans a year at this plant in Forsyth County. The plant uses a half million gallons of water a day for the 75 shades of jeans it produces here or chicken. The Wayne Farms processing plant in Surrey County uses up to 800,000 gallons of water a day for the 110,000 chickens that it processes each day. The cost of water affects what we pay for soft drinks, tobacco products, medical care, electronics, and many, many other commercial products that we use every day. So, where does this sediment come from? some from farming and logging, but a lot less than in previous years. Since 1990, farmers and loggers have been using soil conservation measures, such as no-till agriculture that reduce the amount of soil that washes into the river when it rains. These measures can be very effective. For example, in Yadkin County, erosion from farmland dropped from 62 tons per acre in 1988 to just eight tons per acre in 1995. So where does the rest of the sediment come from? Most of it comes from eroding stream banks. Stream banks can erode for a number of reasons. 
<laughs> in urban areas, stream banks tend to erode because of the large proportion of land that is covered with buildings, streets, and parking lots. Instead of soaking into the ground, rain washes off these impervious surfaces and into the storm sewers. The storm sewers dump the runoff into creeks and streams. The result is that when it rains hard, there's a lot more water being dumped into the streams and creeks than they used to get. The force of the water surging down the creek can scour out the stream banks, just like the water from this garden hose. Left to themselves, stream banks are protected by the trees and bushes that grow along them. This vegetation absorbs runoff, and the roots anchor the stream bank. If you look upriver here, you'll see that we have trees along both banks. Those trees provide stability to the river's bank, but in addition to that, they also shade the water, which you can see up under the trees, keeps the water cooler and makes for better fish habitat. But when vegetation is cleared to allow access for livestock or for development, or simply because it doesn't look good, the banks can start eroding. And once erosion sets in, it can be hard to stop. As the bank erodes, it dumps soil into the stream. This soil puts more pressure on stream banks downstream, creating even more erosion. It becomes a vicious cycle. This is one of the worst cases of stream bank erosion we found on the South Fork of the Mitchell River. The stream bank I'm standing on originally stood well over 100 feet in that direction. And over the last 10 to 15 years, because of the lack of good vegetation along the stream bank in this location, the river has washed through this terrace, similar to what I'm standing in front of, and all that sediment has ended up in the river. We've measured upstream and downstream erosion occurring similar to this, and based on that, our estimates are that over 2,400 tons of sediment have left this one section of stream bank each year. That sediment goes directly in the stream, and from here it ends up down in the Mitchell River and eventually it makes its way to the Yadkin River. This is just one small trib, one of many along the Mitchell River, the Mitchell being just one of many tribs along the upper reaches of the Yadkin River. It's easy to see how if there's this much sediment from just 400 feet of stream bank in this location and you begin to add up the miles and miles of tributaries and rivers that flow into the Yadkin, how much sediment the Yadkin has to handle. So, how much sediment are we talking about in the Yadkin? This dump truck behind me holds 15 tons of soil. Every year, well over a million tons of sediment washes into the river. That's almost 67,000 dump truck loads dumped into the river every year. If we line those trucks up end to end, you'd have a line of trucks 350 miles long, long enough to stretch all the way across North Carolina, from Murphy to Wilmington. Now that's a lot of sediment. Once all this dirt is in the river, it needs to go someplace. When sediment is deposited, we call it sedimentation. Map. I said, I want to build a house on the river. And they looked at me and they Tom Lindheimer, who lives along the river in Forsyth County, learned firsthand about sedimentation when his property was surveyed three years ago. Is that, is that we were here with a metal scanner and scanned the whole area. And every once in a while, we get a faint tick here and there. And of course, I was digging and, and, and uh, the uh, man directing the survey was dig here, dig there. Uh, but he kept getting a tick here. We didn't find anything. So I dug down and down and down. And when I got to the bottom, no kidding, with a D handle, my knuckles were just hitting the ground and it went dink. And it was the top of the post. This property was last surveyed in the 50s. So in order not to show you, not to disturb the existing stake, I've dug another hole further down that'll demonstrate how far down we had to go to hit the top of the stake. And again, this is how much uh, silt has been deposited here over that course of time. That's now sitting on hard dirt, or harder dirt. And that's how deep it was. I had no idea how awesome this river was, none. None. I mean, you, know, you drive across it, it's way the heck down there, you say, oh, Yadkin River. But 
when you see it in your backyard, it, it, it's, a, it's a different perspective. Of course, the problem with sedimentation affects more than just property owners along the river. Everyone who buys water from a water system pays not only for the cost of removing sediment from the water, but the cost of cleaning out accumulated sediment in the water treatment plant. The water in the Yakin River has a lot of uh, sediment in it that settles out in our raw water reservoirs. Eventually, these fill up to a point uh, to where we have to drain them and clean them out. This is a cost of approximately $200,000 um, that we have to uh, recover through our water rates. And sediment can fill reservoirs created for generating power. This is High Rock Lake, a reservoir created when a dam was built on the Yadkin in 1927. The Aluminum Company of America, as it was then called, built the dam to generate power for its aluminum smelting plant in Baden. A study in the early 1990s estimated that almost 995,000 tons of sediment flow into the lake each year from the Yadkin and South Yadkin rivers. And that's down about 30% compared with 40 years earlier. Most of this sediment gets trapped behind the dam and settles to the bottom of the lake. Over time, it begins to add up. It's easy to see the effects of sedimentation in the shallow parts of the lake. Several sandy islands and marshy areas have formed that did not exist when the dam was built. They have formed from sediment carried by the river into the lake. These wetlands have created ideal habitat for wildlife. But all this sediment is decreasing the amount of water the reservoir can hold, which defeats one of the purposes for having the reservoir. Left alone, the lake would eventually fill up. It could end up looking like this. This is Lake Catherine, a private lake that tobacco magnate R.J. Reynolds built on his estate in Winston-Salem. Today, it's all marsh. But in 1917, when it was first formed, it was an open lake. It took only a few decades for the lake to be filled in by sediment in the creek. Stream bank stabilization projects can reduce sedimentation by restoring vegetation along stream banks and redirecting the flow of water away from erosion prone areas. We're sitting on the South Fork of the Mitchell River. South Fork is a section of the Mitchell that's heavily impacted by sediment and most of that sediment comes from bank erosion from sites like you see here. We're in the middle of a restoration on this site right now. The, uh, problems were caused by the lack of trees along the river. The lack of trees allowed the river bank to begin to erode and because there was nothing but fescue, the river bank would not restabilize itself. So we've had to come in and try to help the river out. We're using nature as a blueprint to decide how best to do our job. This rock I'm sitting on right here probably weighs on the order of two tons. We're not using these rock to armor the bank, but instead we're using these rock to to uh, install structures like cross veins, rock veins, and J-hook veins. What these structures do is help focus the energy of the river away from the stream banks and out into the center of the channel. This is an example of a cross vein. This structure is built out of rocks weighing as much as two tons. It serves several functions in the process of restoring a river. The first thing it does is the weir across the middle establishes the bed elevation of the river. The arms of the vein help to focus the energy of the river down the center of the channel. In doing so, they protect the stream banks well up and down from the structure. By protecting the stream banks and reducing the amount of energy along the stream bank, it enables vegetation to get established, and ultimately it's that vegetation and the woody buffer along the river that will restore and maintain this healthy ecosystem. We're at the same site you just saw under construction. It's three months later and the stream restoration project's been completed. We've realigned the channel. We've installed structures like this cross vein that I'm standing on. We've created a floodplain for the river and we've revegetated the stream banks. Now where I'm standing was three feet underwater less than a week ago. Before the restoration, we'd have lost hundreds of tons from the eroding stream bank that used to be back here. 
As a result of the restoration, we lost virtually no sediment to the river. It was a very effective stream restoration project. While stream restoration can be very effective in improving water quality, it's also very expensive. A far better approach is to protect water quality from the start, and that's something that we can all help with. If you have areas on your property that are prone to erosion, plant some sort of ground cover in the area. The roots will help hold the soil in place. If you have a creek or stream on your property, leave the natural vegetation along it. It may not look as nice, but it will stabilize the bank and absorb runoff. When you fertilize your yard, take care not to overdo it. Too much fertilizer is actually harmful to your lawn, and the excess leaches out. And take care to make sure your fertilizer hits the target. Fertilizer on sidewalks and driveways washes off into storm drains and eventually ends up in the river. Resist the impulse to dump used motor oil, paints, or chemicals into storm drains or drainage ditches. Finally, don't turn our streams and creeks into dumps. are a powerful connection across the generations. Buildings come and go. Forests are cleared for farms and reclaimed by the forest, but the river remains. Rivers provoke feelings of respect, awe, fear, curiosity, and joy. Rivers exude power and personality. For thousands of years, they have inspired painters, poets, and novelists. They are beauty in the beast, comforting in their serenity, and terrifying when swollen into an angry, churning mass. Our river, the Yadkin, is the sum of its tributaries, and the tributaries tell the story of our stewardship, not only of the water, but the land. The river we leave our children will speak volumes about us, but the ending isn't written yet. That will depend on you and me. changed, changed with time.